Ben McPherson, Professor Emeritus of Conservation Biology at the University of Arizona. I was paid to work at the University of Arizona for 20 years. For one academic year before that, I was at Texas A&M University. My PhD was granted by, the, by Texas Tech University in 1987. Throughout my graduate studies, I was pursuing knowledge about climate change as a part of the plant ecology and ecosystem ecology underpinning for my graduate research. So I pursued active service at the University of Arizona, meaning teaching and conducting research for 20 years. I voluntarily left that organization in May of 2009 because it appeared at that time that collapse of industrial civilization was a, the only hope, the only chance to prevent runaway greenhouse, to present um, an abrupt rise in global average temperature on Earth. We knew, according to the refereed journal literature, we knew nothing at the time about global dimming or the aerosol masking effect. We knew very little about abrupt climate change at all. And so I pursued what I thought was realistic evidence pointing to civilization being problematic on multiple levels. In voluntarily leaving active service at the university and establishing a homestead in southern rural New Mexico, I gave up a lot of privilege and became subject to a lot of personal attacks as a result of my professional life. So again, Professor of Conservation Biology at the University of Arizona, and what that means is that I have studied the primary pillars underlying conservation biology. Speciation, or how a species comes into existence, and through what process and through what predecessors. Extinction, how and when the last individual, the last example of a species dies, and habitat. If I had a motto, it would be habitat, 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 because that's what really matters to all animals and plants, to all organisms, in fact, including human animals. I'm often asked to give an overview of the planetary situation at this point. It's clear that this version of civilization, and by civilization I mean the ability to grow, store, and distribute grains at large scale, it's clear that this version of civilization, industrial civilization, has many untoward outcomes that are generally ignored. Those include, as with every civilization, endemic misogyny, endemic racism, endemic monetary disparity leading to poverty. They also include the fouling of the air, the dirtying of the water, the essentially strip mining the soil and washing it into the ocean. They also include, as with every civilization, the emission of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. Even if it's only by putting a spade into the ground and turning that shovel over when done at large scale, that causes carbon dioxide and methane to be transmitted into the atmosphere. With respect to the latter phenomenon leading to climate change, global climate change, or what is sometimes called global warming, and, and for the most part, climate scientists have moved away from that term global warming towards climate change in recognition of the fact that warming is not evident at some particular places, at least for some particular times. So whereas the climate overall is warming, what that produces is extreme snowfall events and extreme cold events in certain places, for, sometimes for extended periods of time. But that's a result of overall planetary warming. It's a result of the profound increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere of Earth. So I want to talk briefly about that portion of the outcomes of industrial civilization. By that portion, I mean climate change, or global climate change, or overall planetary warming. Currently, the level of methane in the atmosphere is more than 240% higher than it was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, commonly pegged at about 1750. In addition, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about somewhere around 40% or more higher than it was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And of course, civilizations began thousands of years ago, so 
I'm not sure we should be using 1750 as the starting point for civilization or industrial civilization. Even industrial civilization began before 1750, so I think it's fairly conservative to use 1750 as the baseline for when climate change at the global level got underway. That said, we'll stick with that because that's a scientific standard. It appears at this point that we are in the midst of abrupt climate change, not merely the linear gradual increase in global average temperature that has been observed since the 1750s, but rather an event similar to what has been reported in the past in sediment records that indicates a global average rise in temperature somewhere at or greater than 8.7 degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline over the course of the next eight or nine years. So that's a very abrupt rise in global average temperature far beyond the ability of organisms to adapt genetically or otherwise. As a starting point, very few species are able to move from one location to another, certainly not the plants. Plants form the basis for our entire existence. They're the basis of the terrestrial food web and also the marine food web, in that case in the form of phytoplankton. So we're in the midst of, or the early stages of, this process or phenomenon called abrupt climate change that is certain to remove habitat for human beings on a planetary basis in the very near future. And we need habitat to survive. Now you might argue that we can go to the International Space Station and we have. We can go to nuclear submarines and we have. And we can persist a while. But all of the quote habitat that is found for us in those locations is provided by the living planet, provided by Earth. All of the food for those locations comes from this living planet, not from someplace else. And so in supporting our existence in places like the International Space Station and nuclear submarines, we're really just treating those vessels as spaceships much as we ought to have been treating Earth as a spaceship for all of these years. And we haven't. So we have largely spoiled the planet the only planet on which we are known to survive and, and likely which we are able to survive. We also find ourselves in the midst of a couple of predicaments, or, and, and further than that, we find ourselves in the midst of a couple of paradoxes. One, civilization is a heat engine. Based on the laws of therm thermodynamics, primarily as reported by Tim Garrett at the University of Utah, Civilization is a heat engine. No matter how we operate the thing, civilization itself is a heat engine. It doesn't matter if we use solar panels, wind turbines, wave power, or fossil fuels. Civilization itself is a heat engine. And in every case, we're relying upon finite materials to power this set of living arrangements. The paradox is that civilization is a heat engine, but shutting off civilization heats the planet even faster because of the aerosols we put up into the atmosphere as a result of civilization. So civilization does a couple of things simultaneously. It puts up these greenhouse gases that serve as something of a blanket to hold the heat close to Earth. And civilization also puts up these aerosols, most notably sulfates associated with burning coal high in sulfur. And in the process, the planet cools through industrial activity. These aerosols, these sulfates, these particulars are put up in the atmosphere and serve as something of an umbrella. So we're simultaneously heating the planet with the blankets put up through, through emissions of greenhouse gases. So those greenhouse gases hold the warmth closer to the Earth. And we also put up this, these umbrella-style particulates which serve to cool the Earth. Within a matter of weeks after industrial civilization fails, the planet heats up catastrophically quickly, way faster than basically any organism on the planet, certainly including the most complex of organisms, Homo sapiens, could keep up. So that's one predicament associated, or one paradox associated with the predicament of 
global climate change is that we are heating the planet through industrial activity and if we turn off industrial activity we heat the planet even faster. If one paradox isn't enough, how about a second one? According to one of the most conservative scientific bodies in the history of the planet, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in their vaunted fifth assessment, we need to use geoengineering. We need to massively geoengineer planet's atmospheric chemistry, or we're done. Or we've triggered such a rapid rise in global average temperature that civilization will fail and so will all habitat for human beings disappear along with a lot of other organisms on the planet. So we must massively geoengineer planetary chemistry or we're done. The paradox is geoengineering doesn't work. There is no evidence to indicate geoengineering works and lots of evidence to indicate that it won't work as presented by among the most conservative scientific bodies on planet Earth, right up there with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the United States National Academy of Sciences, in 2015, reported that geoengineering is unlikely to help the situation, and so did a European body of similar stature later that same year, 2015. So we have these two paradoxes. We must geoengineer the planet. Geoengineering won't work. We, we must stop warming the planet through emission of greenhouse gases. And yet if we do, the planet heats up even faster. As if two, two paradoxes were not enough, we also have another predicament. We're in the, mix, in the midst of the sixth mass extinction on planet Earth, a process which was described by conservation biologists in a paper in the prestigious Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And the, the title of that paper includes the phrase biological annihilation. Biological Annihilation, appearing in the title of a Referee Journal article. This is not the National Enquirer we're talking about, folks. This is not some, some hyperbolic rag that you pick up on your way to the counter at, at the grocery store. This is among the most conservative scientific bodies on the planet. The Referee Journal literature reporting via headline, Biological Annihilation, and indicating that it's underway. And so we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction on planet Earth. We have these two paradoxes, either one of which indicates loss of habitat and therefore loss of humans on Earth in the near future. Oh, and by the way, in the wake of the previous five mass extinction events on Earth, many millions of years were required to recover beyond relatively small organisms, beyond microbes, bacteria and fungi and small organisms before we had a verdant, thriving planet again. So I strongly suspect that in, indeed we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction on planet Earth and that it will take many millions of years before very complex organisms such as Homo sapiens evolves again, if that ever happens. And according to the latest literature from the planetary sciences, it could be that that never happens. It could be that we strip away the atmosphere and destroy the biosphere for Earth forever. We don't know that. We don't know which of these outcomes is most likely to occur. And we will never know because human beings are going to go away. We'll be among the early of the species to disappear as a result of the sixth mass extinction on Earth. So there we are. Two paradoxes, either of which points to our extinction in the near term. We're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction on planet Earth, which points to our extinction in the near term. And none of this can be overcome with anything resembling the technology we currently have at our disposal. None of it can be overcome with a shift in consciousness by human beings on planet Earth. We're in overshoot. We have so many other topics that I could talk about that point to our untimely demise. But all in all, it looks like we have a very limited future as a species on Earth. That brings me great sadness, and it's not at all a surprise. I'm disappointed. I'm certainly not surprised. 
that we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction, that our species hovers on the brink, that we have very little time left.